everybody. You guys are morning people. I'm not. Um, I'm not. But you know, I am thrilled uh, to be here and thrilled to welcome you all to Ensemble Theater. Um, and I, I want to share some things that you probably may not know about the process of creating theater in what was designed to be a bank building. Uh, in fact, this building was uh, one of the first banks in the Midwest. Um, it was the Union Savings Bank. And uh, I brought my uh, notes to make sure I got the years correctly. So uh, our building that we're sitting in right here was built in 1904. And Union Savings was eventually bought out by Fifth Third. And then this building became an Italian consulate. And it was an Italian consulate for many years. And then this building became the auto print shop. And uh, the auto print shop was famous for being the first printing company in the States to print uh, the backstage passes for rock concerts. So uh, when the 60s happened and the 70s happened, auto printing patented this sort of fabulously cool like backstage pass, all pass thing. You guys still wear them on lanyards today, you know, if you end up having to go somewhere backstage. And they got too big for the, for the building here because it was a historic building and they didn't want to recreate it. So they moved out and, uh, and some folks that wanted to start a professional theater uh, bought this building in 86. So uh, 30 years this building's been a theater and uh, they, they bought this building building and the adjoining building behind it, uh, which is a four-story tenement house. They bought it for $100,000 and then spent $3 million renovating it. So uh, it was a good buy at first, but it ended up costing a whole bunch of money. Um, and then next door to us, which is one of my favorite things about Ensemble Theater, is that if you look at the box office and then you look, there's like a doorway right behind it. You walk through that doorway and you would be in the 1125 bar. Now that was originally built late in the 18... Where was it? 1890. Okay, that little building was built in 1890. And it was built, and for a while, it was a store for people who loved birds. It lasted two years. I don't know. People <laughs> loved birds, went to that store. But then in the 60s, it became the 1125 bar. And what, anybody know what that bar was famous for? More homicides than any bar in Cincinnati. <laughs> and when it rains, it smells like pee and beer. Okay, that is the truth. <laughs> so then there's this empty lot, and we really don't know what was there. Okay, we know it was some kind of a tenement house. We know it had a basement. We just don't know what it was because it was gone before I got here and was gone before they bought this property. Then next to that is this big, flat-faced, glass-fronted building. Um, and that building came into being in... 1920, 1912, okay, so 1912. Um, this was 1904, next door was 1890, then 1912. And that building that you'll see as you leave that has the wrap of our, our uh, designs, like pictures in the front of it, that building was a man's manufacturing company, and then it became just a, a, fact, a manufacturing company for hats, and then it became a man's clothing sales store. Then it became, for many years, a store called Poli's Big and Tall, which is the most completely politically incorrect statement now. But yeah, we're talking like the 40s and the 50s, so big and tall men would go buy clothes there. Um, then Devereaux's bought it out, and it was Devereaux's warehouse for a long time, and then we ended up um, purchasing it. So. You're sitting in a place that has a long history in OTR, and uh, uh, we own 40% of the block. So why? Why? Why a theater? There's other theaters in town. There's the Playhouse, where I worked for, for many years. There's the Aronoff, where the touring shows come in. There's small theaters like um, The No and Edgecliffe and, and Next, all these kind of different little theater companies. There's Cincy Shakes, which is building a new house up here by Music Hall. There's all that stuff going on. So what's different about ETC? You tell me. Who knows? Anybody here know what's different about us? Where's Dr. Gaston's daughter? Is Dr. Gaston's daughter here? Somebody went, hi, there you are. Hi, I know you've been to the thing. Uh, Dr. Gaston is my um, beloved Maggie, my dog's vet, okay? And, 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 and we love him very much. In fact, there's a character in Cinderella named Gaston 
but it's spelled just like Gaston, right? So, um, so I know you know some stuff. What do you know? What's different about ETC? Can I put you on the spot? Uh, I think I've heard it, but I don't remember what I was told. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> That's all right. This isn't a test. I'm just glad that you're here. Um, anybody, come on. We are an equity theater, and the Cincinnati Playhouse is an equity theater, and the main stage of Cincinnati Shakes is now an equity theater. What does that mean? That means we get paid. Our actors do this for a living. It's not a hobby, okay? They make their living as professional actors. We pay into pension and health. Um, if they have so many weeks, they, they end up with health care. If they don't have so many weeks, they don't. But they're paid to be here. We um, do a work week like any other business, all right? It's not free volunteer help. These people make their living on our stages uh, and our designers and our administrative offices. This is professional theater. So that's a little different than uh, a theater like uh, the Covedale, who people may get stipends or something for, and there's nothing wrong with that. You can come on in if you want to, please. This is very informal. Um, or, uh, you know, that, that's okay. That's all great. It's just this level is... You show up, you get paid. You don't, you don't. <laughs> we don't hire you again. What else is different about ETC? New works. New works, yeah. So, um, so when you go to theater in Cincinnati, and, and I love theater in Cincinnati because it's so diverse and there's so many different things you can go to. Uh, driving in, you know, I saw like two different marquees this morning of shows coming. Ensemble theater is dedicated to the production of works which are new to this region or brand new. So why is that important? It's important because theater has to become a younger art form. Theater has to become a form that is about what's contemporary today, while with great respect to Ibsen and Williams and Miller and all those folks, um, what is on your minds today? What's in the news today? What is, you know, why, why do, you know, I have a 24-hour feed on my phone? Why, you know, what do you care about? Theater has to address that because it's one of our earliest social communications um, that we can put issues on the stage. You know, for many years, my, my dad was a cop for many, many years, and in fact, most of his life. So my goal in life was to become a lawyer, to release from prison all the people I felt he wrongfully incarcerated. <laughs> was going to change everything back. But what I found out, what I found out at a, at a really kind of luckily early age was that, wow, there's this thing called theater. And by the way, I only got into theater, honestly, this is the truth. And of course, I'm so bummed this is like going to be taped because I thought this was just going to be us having a conversation. <laughs> so now that people know this, that they, they go to the website. But um, I had a friend in high school named Connie. And Connie was very pretty and Connie was very popular. And Connie was not shy at all about anything. And so um, I went to Mother Mercy High School. And she and, and Mother Mercy High School had a theater program. But basically, the coolest thing about being in an all-girls school was you got to go work at the all-boys schools and their shows. So LaSalle was having auditions for a play, and I had done some speech stuff. So Connie comes up to me, and she goes, here's the deal. You're going to go. You're going to audition for the play. And then I can like hang out over there if you get cast and meet all the guys. And, um, that's, and I did that. So, so I followed her anywhere. And, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I'm not going to get cast. Well, I did. I had a line. I had a big one-liner uh, in a play called The Mouth That Roared, which is a very infamously bad. Uh, but, but Connie ended up like getting all these incredible dates. I mean, she was like having the time of her life. And, uh, and there I was doing my one line. Um, but there was this cool thing about people coming together and working really hard for a finite amount of time to get this show up. And then when it was over, it was like, wow, this feels awful, you know? And I really never got that excited about being in shows, but I looked around at what other people were doing and I thought, oh my gosh, somebody told us what to wear, you know? Somebody designed the set that we were on. That was really interesting. And the guy who directed it was a great guy by the name of Bob Sarbre really good director and just a really good teacher at the school at the time. And I watched him and I watched how much he cared about giving all the students a chance to shine so that there were people like me who had one line. They could have totally done without me. Nobody would have ever missed me. But you know, what he did was he picked these shows that gave all of us these little shots, these little, you know, opportunities. And I thought, well, this is a really interesting way to get a message out. This is a really interesting way because we would do, you know, these kind of open discussion things in high school about everybody come and share your opinions and there'd be like 10 of us and a guitar and that would be it, you know. And, um, 
you know, we'd all listen to each other talk, and it was far from interesting. But in theater, I thought, you could do this. So then I, um, uh, very long story short, um, got in a bunch of trouble my senior year in high school, and a um, <laughs> bunch of trouble. I popped off for something I believed in and still believe in, and, um, and they yanked my scholarship to Brown. They yanked my scholarship to, uh, to what was then Edgecliff College. They, they yanked all my scholarships that were full rides, so I was broke. And they needed to go to college because nobody in my family had ever gone to college. So I went over to Thomas More College. I knocked on their door, uh, and they were awesome. They were awesome. I told them, like, hey, this is why I got in trouble because I popped off. I popped off to the archbishop. I popped off to the PTA. <laughs> they think I'm not a good representation of what makes a good Catholic. So they took all my scholarships away. And rather than judge me for that, Thomas More went, you know what? This is about free thinking. I mean, we're named for a guy who got killed for his beliefs and wrote something called Utopia. So, you know, come on in. And um, they were awesome. And there was no scholarship money, but they let me work my way through three degrees, four years, a little under four years. And, um, and that was a place where we really could be free thinkers. So I, were, I, you know, I was bringing plays to them that they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, no, this is this really new play and this is really exciting. So then it got accepted to the MFA program at Yale and he had no money still. Money is an ongoing theme in this, in this today. And by the way, I got the email already that I had been a past speaker yesterday. So I felt like that was so cool that whoever sent me that email about, about your uh, morning sessions here had time traveled and had already heard my <laughs> speech. Um, but I'm going to send in my five bucks because you know what? I mean, if nothing more, um, this is a great opportunity to get together in the morning. And you can't go to Starbucks and get this, all right? So, so I, I do think it's a great, it's a great program. So that's my, that's my pitch, Jeremy, for that. Um, but so MFA program at Yale. Big competitive program. I get into the directing program, no money. So ended up going to work at Cincinnati Playhouse by accident. I went to New York for two whole days, my big graduation trip. And uh, in these whopping two days, I met this awesome playwright named Robert Anderson, who uh, wrote a lot of plays that you guys may have never heard of. But you have heard of a line from one of his plays. You may have heard of a line that says, years from now, when you speak of this, and you will be kind. You may hear that quoted usually sarcastically in half-hour sitcoms, OK? Uh, will and Grace used it like 17 or 18 or 20 times. Um, <laughs> but, anyway, um, but anyway, he was a cool playwright. I did a lot of work about him, uh, on him uh, when I was in, in, in that kind of you know, undergrad work. And I expected to do my thesis on him as I moved forward, but it wasn't to be. So um, I wrote a bunch of letters, 47 to be exact, to every theater in the country looking for a job. Got one bad, really beautiful response from uh, Alaska Rep which said, oh, God, we wish we could hire you, but we can't. So, uh, and you know what? Eventually, like 10 years later, I ended up working for him. I cast a show for them, so that was cool. And the other was a phone call from Playhouse, because their assistant had just quit. Their assistant, the producing artistic, had just quit. And he's like, where do you live? You mailed this from New York, but you have a Cincinnati phone number. And I'm like, well, I thought it would look cooler if I mailed it from New York, but I live in Cincinnati. <laughs> so um, he's like, oh, OK, well, come on up here. And, and so I met with him, and he's like, you are completely unqualified. You're just coming out of school. And I'm like, I know. but." I work really hard, and he goes, how cheaply? And I go, well, pretty cheap. So um, $65.67 was my take-home pay. And that was with uh, three degrees coming out of Thomas More College. And it wasn't in 1902, OK? It wasn't that many years ago. But, um, but anyway, worked there for, for 10 years and uh, left. Ended up working in LA, New York, and um, then I, and in New York and LA, it was great because what I did, um, and I'm a big believer in multitasking, all right? Anybody who comes in here and goes, I'm sorry, uh, my job is to only enter this data for six hours, and then I have, it, well, I think you're crazy because um, I take every job somebody offers me, even today. And uh, when I was at Playhouse, I got a call from some guy I didn't know by the name of Sam Manners, who was a CBS producer. And he said, we need somebody to do location casting for a film. Do you know anybody to recommend? And I'm like, does it pay? And he said, yeah. And I go, I can do that. <laughs> and um, didn't know what that was. No idea. But the bottom line was, you say yes. And then you figure it out, you know? And as it turned out, I could do it. It was about finding local people to be in a TV movie that starred Johnny Cash, the late Johnny Cash. And it was kind of awesome. 
because I was able to look around town at all these actors who weren't working because there was no ETC in those days, and I got them all jobs in this movie. And then at this incredible rap party where Johnny Cash and June Carter Cash sat there and played an hour concert for us after they made us all food. They gave everybody the kitchen in the kitchen, the staff off, out at the Marriott out on Pfeiffer Road, and they cooked for us. And I thought, oh my God, so film, there's an idea. You can spread ideas that way too. So when I left the Playhouse, I ended up in New York and LA doing a lot of casting, a lot of directing, oddly enough, in Canada. If anybody needs a Canadian equity member, I'm here. Uh, I can't get you citizenship in Canada, but I can get you, I just, I, if you ever need to go to Canada, just see me, okay? Um, <laughs> So that was a whole bunch of fun. I did that for, for a lot of years, and I got this really weird phone call. And um, this phone call was from a board president I didn't know at ETC, and he said, here's the deal. Um, it was July 3rd. I remember very specifically it was July 3rd. I was living in LA, and I was finally making money. I mean, I was making good money. I was um, engaged to a really wonderful guy, uh, and we had a wedding plans, and all of everything in my life was phenomenal. And then I got this phone call, and he said, could you come back for three months to Cincinnati? We know when you were at the Playhouse, you did a lot of financial contracts and stuff. Could you come back and help us close the Ensemble Theater? And I said, well, that is a really odd request. And he said, well, there's debt. Neighborhood's in trouble. We love the theater. We want it to work, but we don't think we can make it work. So we thought, since you, if you came back, and I had directed a couple shows as a guest artist here uh, after I'd left the Playhouse, if you come back, maybe you can help us straighten it out, because a lot of people put a lot of money and time into this. So I came back and found out we were a million seven in unsecured debt. Uh, didn't know where it went, and I can tell you right now, it was not a criminal issue. It was not that, not, not, not. What it was was just a bunch of really, really well-intentioned people not managing it properly. And that didn't mean anybody tried to do anything wrong. It's just really easy in a not-for-profit company to get ahead of yourself and to have visions and dreams and maybe not, you know, maybe because there were incidents in the neighborhood, you had a performance that, you know, 20 people came to, you know. Um, but what we realized was you couldn't afford to close couldn't afford to close. And I emotionally couldn't afford to close because that would have felt like a defeat, even though it wasn't my debt. So um, for the last 20 years, I have spent time here uh, believing that a theater dedicated to new works, new ideas, socially conscious material, not Fiddler on the Roof, not Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, not any other play with roof in it, just, <laughs> just plays that speak to the social heart of who we are that would attract a younger audience, that would help transform a neighborhood. And I utterly believed we could do that. And it is about belief to begin with that ETC was founded. We can support another professional theater, all right? That's what the people who founded this theater believed. We can support another professional theater and we can employ local professionals so they don't leave the minute they graduate school and go to New York, Chicago, or LA, which is exactly what happened. We can support people like Dale Hodges, Annie Fitzpatrick, these wonderful actresses who had careers all over the globe but had family ties here. We can support young couples like uh, Leslie and David Baum, who are Broadway stars, who came back to Cincinnati because he wanted to finish his degree and they wanted to start a family. And you know what? They did. Within the two years, three years they've been here, they now have a house, they have a baby, they have, they have roots in this community. So it was about supporting those kind of artists. And um, it was really an interesting journey. You had to deal with a lot of stuff. 10% of our operating budget went to security. We had five cops out there so that we could get in and out without getting shot. And I'm not exaggerating. We were the backdrop in 01 for the, uh, quote, riots. And trust me, they weren't riots. What they were was a political statement about people who had just simply had enough. And it erupted in front of Ensemble Theater, not because they didn't like Ensemble Theater, but because the barricades went up at Central Parkway. So you couldn't go downtown and rush City Hall. You had to stay here and churn this anger into this rage that outpoured in April. And it happened to be a really hot, stormy April, which didn't make things any better. And 13 innocent men had been killed. So you know what? 
It was a convergence. We had just, by the way, <laughs> in 99, had this spectacular season where we started to sell subscriptions. We were the first theater in the country to, to produce a play called Sodman, which had just won the Tony in June, and we did it in September. We did this marvelous, um, marvelous musical called Violet, which at that time was brand new. <clears throat> And we got the rights to it, first regional production. So we were building this energy, and we were working with the Ohio Innocence Project, and then, bam, 01 happened. Well, you know, what do you do? How do you react to that? How do you get people to come down here when staff members were frightened to come down here, when we were going in and out the back door? How do you still believe in ETC at 1127 Vine when you have a, a couple million dollar offer on the table to move to Covington? How do you still believe in that? How do you get audiences back? How did we do it? What did we do the summer of 01? Anybody know? Bonus prize. <laughs> I got some stuff. I got like tote bags. I got stuff. <laughs> we did a musical called Hedwig and the Angry Inch, which is a rock musical about a botched sex change operation that leaves a singer, Hedwig, uh, in a trailer park here in the States alone and uh, forming a band called the Angry Inch. I'm not going to explain what happened in the sex change operation. You can fill in the blank. But <laughs> we went ahead and did this really bold 2001. All right, now I know, I know about the Neil Patrick Harris and it was just back on Broadway and that's awesome and cool. We're talking 2001. Like you guys are in grade school, 2001. Uh, and that's cool, that's fine. But in 2001, we did the rock musical, and what we did was we found the best players from all the indie bands in town. So uh, John Curley, who's the bassist for a little band called Afghan Wigs, was our music director. We had people from the Ass Ponies. We had pe people from Culture Queer. We had all these indie bands at the time, and we got the best players. They converged on the stage. We got Todd Allman, who had come out of CCM. So he was in his platform in his wig. He was almost seven feet tall, because he's six foot four without any of that. We got A. Beth Harris, who has, in my opinion, the best female rock voice, not only maybe in this area, but quite frankly, possibly on the planet. We got her to be in the show. And what happened was theater people didn't come. People who followed bands came. Then people who, who liked theater followed the band people. And then we sold 95% capacity. And we were able to open in 01, in September of 01. And then 9-11 happened. And everybody went home and locked their doors because we didn't know what was next. And we were doing a comedy about New York at the time. And you know what we did? We just kept on doing it. We kept on doing it to pay tribute to all those folks that were to totally destroyed by this. And then in the fall of 02, we did a play called The Guys about uh, a fire captain who lost eight of his men in the World Trade Center on that day. And that same actor who was in The Guys in 2002, September of 2002, is in this play right here that, you're, that you, I hope, will see, Annapurna. So um, it was about building lasting relationship. It was about dealing with businesses in town. And one of the best businesses in town was on this corner where Belgian Waffle now stands, uh, was a crack dealer. And um, he was really good at it. He was a very, very, very successful low-end crack dealer. So he sold really cheap crack. And you could go um, both ways on 12th, right? So he could work either corner, and he was seriously busier than Starbucks on Monday morning. Um, <laughs> and in those days, the further uptown you went, the higher the drugs got. Every corner had somebody dealing on it, okay? And we're talking early 2000s here. So um, every corner had somebody. So you would go from this level crack to a better level crack, You'd eventually get up to cocaine, you know. There'd be a few quaaludes and, and stuff mixed in for old time's sake. Um, so, so every drug till you got to Liberty got a little more expensive, but we were like at the rot gut cheap end, uh, and people were ch -ch 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 driving by. Well, he was selling before my shows, and I'm like, this is bad for business, because it, at the time, the parking, the, where those condos are across the street and the parking garage across the street, that was an empty lot. So um, you could park there for ETC, but in order to get to our door, you had to walk by the guy on the corner unless you jaywalked in the middle of the street and there were cops because we had hired them to be out front. So, um, so what do you do? You've got a business problem. I went and talked to him. And I said, here's the deal. Yeah. I said, uh, I run this theater. Yeah. I'm like, well, you have a business. He glared at me. <laughs> I have a business. He glared at me. And I said, I need you to not sell a half hour before my shows and a half hour after my shows. That's all I need. 
I'm, I, I'm not judging you. You have a business, I have a business. I want to come to some sort of business arrangement. What can I do for you to not sell a half hour before my shows or a half hour after my shows? What can I do? And he looked at me like I was from outer space. <laughs> and he said, case of Heineken every Friday. <laughs> and can I have a schedule? So I gave him a typed schedule, a printed schedule of our shows. So if, he, if the show was going to start at 8 o'clock, by 7.30 he would leave. If the show was over at 10 o'clock, by 10.30 he'd be back. It was a business deal. And for three years, I gave him a case of Heineken every Friday at 5 o'clock with the type schedule of our shows. He honored that arrangement. And then one day he was just gone. And I didn't look for him. But it's about being creative. It's about being in the business of not jeopardizing who you are because you're scared of continuing. We never had the op option. We never had a comfort level that we would continue. And to this day, we don't have that. We did a play that, that critics in town universally agreed they didn't like. It was a play called Praying for Rain. It was a play about a young man whose friend had committed suicide and his responsibility and guilt for not having interceded when he saw him in trouble. And we seriously could not give tickets away. So we gave tickets away to a school group called the Dawn School, who in those days was a school, if you got kicked out of everywhere else, it was either go to the Dawn School or go to jail, OK? They were thrilled to be here, you can imagine. So they came in and they were like, oh, 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 oh. you know, they were so, oh, God, they were miserable. They were trying to sleep, but it was noisy. And it was just, but by the end of it, they were kind of like this, OK. Poor actors, oh my gosh. But the next morning I got a call. I walked in and I, again, I'm reiterating, not a morning person, but uh, eight o'clock in the morning I walked in, for some reason I had to be early here. Uh, phone was ringing, picked up the phone, it was a teacher from the school and she said, I just wanna let you know that so and so, I won't use his name, um, came to see the play yesterday and today he threw a chair through a window and it's his third strike so we called the police to take him because three strikes and you go back to, to juvenile detention. And it was because of the play. And I'm like, oh, God. I mean, I can't catch a break. I can't give away tickets to be. Now people are throwing chairs through the windows. And I don't know you, and it's you know tape. So I'm going to clean up the language. But um, when they asked him why he, what he was so upset about, he said it was because of that mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm play. Um, and uh, she said, what? And he said, well, because the mm-mm in the play uh, taught me that you know, if you off yourself, uh, nothing changes. And she goes, what are you talking about? In his locker was a suicide note and a gun. Um, this was before we had metal detectors everywhere in schools. And he had planned that day to shoot himself at school. And he had done it to punish his mother, who he hated, uh, to punish people in the school whom he hated. Uh, he wanted to do it to punish everybody. But because he saw that play, what he realized is he would just be dead. And everybody else would just stick around. So he decided he had to stick around. And he was mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, angry about that. <laughs> but they let him stick around. They let him stay. He didn't graduate until he was about 21. That didn't matter. You can stay at the Dawn School until you were 30 if you wanted to, to get your GED. That wasn't a matter. <clears throat> He's now a manager of a restaurant in Northern Kentucky. He's now married. He now has his own son. If I do no other play in my lifetime, doing that play that was dark and depressing in January in Cincinnati validates my career. That's my opinion. It doesn't pay off my mortgage, you know? It doesn't mean I have a new car. It doesn't mean that I don't have 19 pairs of black pants and wear them every day, all right? <laughs> there's some things, there's some things that that kind of life doesn't give you. But the ability to change as the world around you changes is essential. I get dropped from the bucolic life in LA with a boyfriend whose house is great, and you know I'm driving a cool car, and I'm doing all that. Um, and I get dropped back into my hometown, and it's a war zone. So you adapt. You have a businessman on the corner that happens to sell something you don't like, you adapt. You get rolling, and then the world blows up in 2001, you adapt. You need to put your buildings together to create a better, more artistic, artistic and accessible space. You adapt. And we started making plans to renovate these buildings in 2005. And guess what? It's happening now. 
but you don't go up against Music Hall and you don't go up against all these sort of big pocket places. You go out and raise 4.2 million quietly. And then you go to your people who come to the theater and say, all right, we've got the bricks and mortar money because we own the buildings. Now give us two million so we can infuse the art so that I can hire more artists, so that I can expand my education program, so that I can commission plays that are about the here and now. And this play that's on this stage right now, this is not just like, there wasn't just a bad party last night. The, <laughs> this, is, this is deliberate. This play is a parable about human connection. This play is so close to my heart because um, you know, 20 years from now, you will find somebody that you know now, and regardless of your relationship with them, you will have a compelling need to reconnect with them, and you will realize how little people change over the decades. We are still who we are. We may look different, we may have different skill sets, but once somebody connects with you on a truly honest level, that connection never goes away. And this is a true celebration of that with two marvelous, marvelous artists. And yeah, one of them's named Ulysses and he happy, happens to live in a piece of shit trailer at the foot of a mountain because it's his metaphor for his purgatory, paying for sins he doesn't even remember committing, but he knows he did something that shot his life to hell and back. Next up, Violet's a, uh, an interracial love story set against the backdrop of the Vietnam War, set against the backdrop of some of the greatest music you will ever hear, and nothing against Guys and Dolls, but it sounds nothing like Guys and Dolls, okay? It is not musical theater. It is music in a theater. So we're still doing that. And what the plans are going to happen is we're going to be able to commission more of that. Next year, we're doing a sequel to Cinderella. Who needs a sequel to Cinderella? We do. Why? Because 1,300 kids saw Cinderella for free, free through our Fairy Godmother program. They saw it for free. We raised the money, got the support for people to come in, kids, walking kids from the neighborhood, buses. We had to buy juice boxes. It was really fun. Uh, <laughs> juice boxes and snacks. Those 1,300 kids looked at Cinderella, and one stepsister was black, and one stepsister was white. And the French uh, hand, uh, like sort of um, guardian to the prince of the kingdom, happened to be African American, but was French. All right, and um, our audiences looked like our, our stage looked like our audience. So this is the kind of work we have to do. And the sequel, why not? People came, they like the name Cinderella, so why not? Nobody talks about what happens after they get to the palace. We don't think it's so good. So you know, <laughs> so. We commission it from two fabulous local playwrights. David Kaiser now has international acclaim for his work with children, but you know what? He lives right here. Joe McDonough's plays have been produced around the country, but he started right here. The first season of ETC, there was a Joe McDonough play on this stage. So that's what we do. So our beloved Jeremy has stood up, which means that my time is coming to an end. So if you guys would ask me any questions, that would be great because I'm very cognizant of the fact that you have to vacate the premises because at 10 o'clock something happens. I don't know what happens, but I know <laughs> you gotta be out by 10 o'clock. So questions for me. As you leave, by the way, my beloved team who is also here in the morning, um, they're gonna say, hand you out playbills of Annapurna and a program and a brochure. It still has the two last plays of this season in it. It has a stuffer for next season in it. And in that playbill is some really cool information about how, what we're gonna do when we combine these campuses together. So rather than talk anymore, you can take it home and read all about it. There's also our websites there, Facebook page, you know, Twitter's active. There's so many ways to connect to ETC, social media wise I hope you'll jump on that bandwagon and do it but questions for me right now anybody come on somebody don't make me feel like I bombed up here yes what do you want to see more of it's just any art I mean we have so much diversity and we're very lucky to have you know all, all sides even here today the morning I mean we have designers we have you know uh, advertising experts we have had you know local artists and playwrights as well um what do you want to see more of I mean it's just any art like what do you feel what, what do you want to see more of well more of you Okay, what I want to see is my audience is looking more like you, okay? I want to see younger people. And that's all right. <laughs> I love it. That's all right. Good luck as far as I'm concerned. Um, so what I want is to see more people taking like your $10 ticket, try us out tickets and going free to the museums. And um, so I want to see uh, a broader, wider range of audience. I mean, somebody in the lobby told me that their parents subscribed. That is really super cool. You know, my mom comes too. But, you know, I want my niece that just got out of college and starting to teach. You know, she's the audience that, because I'm not doing plays 
for 85 year old or 75 year old people, they will enjoy it, but I'm doing plays for you. And, I, and, I, and so I would say that what Cincinnati Arts needs more than anything is more people like you guys who will collectively come together to network and spread the word. We can't afford a billboard. We work on 1 17th of the Playhouse's budget. That's okay. That's okay. I don't have 600 seats, but I'm also never going to have a billboard and 55 television ads or hear about To Kill a Mockingbird 17 times in the course of one day, which I did. I did. So, so I need more of this kind of conversation. If I had my way, uh, when we have our new space and we have the ability to do it, we wouldn't have a playback series twice a show. We'd have one every night. We'd have a pre-show discussion like this, so that if you're going to come to a play, but something terrible happened, like what happened in Belgium, we collectively as a community can talk about that before we go to see a play about individual redemption, which is what is the heart of this, what this play is about. Or before we go see a play about Violet, which is a time capsule, but those situations still are relevant today. Do we have enough faith in ourselves to heal? That's what I'd like to see. You said you guys are going to be involved with the Fringe Festival. That's fun. That's cool. It's sporadic. Get around the town. Bless you. See all these other things that are happening around town. But understand that the core principles of professional theater means just that. I need your $10 try us out ticket or your student rush ticket or whatever I need because I'm paying the people that work here. And these, this is job creation. Arts are job creation and that is not celebrated enough in this town. I am so sick of hearing about how many people are employed for this, that, and the other, and not talking about how many people are employed by the arts in this city. I did a number for our, our um, wonderful season sponsor, Otto and Budig. And to the best of my knowledge, 2,211 paid jobs happened since the, in the past 16 years that he donated to this theater. Now, he didn't pay for all those jobs, but he was a leader. He gave us a sponsorship for that. I don't care if you, if you come to a, a performance of Cinderella, ever after, ever, which is what it's called, uh, next year, and as you leave, you drop three bucks in the bucket uh, that we collect to pay for next year's kids, because you know what? That three bucks, it's a jutes box and it's a bus ride to the show. There's little tangible ways. I think sometimes we get overwhelmed by, oh, I've got to subscribe to everything in town to be a patron. No, you're a patron by sitting here this morning. Yes, yes. When you moved back to Cincinnati um, as a, during the millennium, did anyone ever call you crazy? And if so, how did you deal with that? Everyone, <laughs> um, <laughs> including my long suffering uh, fiance, who, um, uh, who, by the way, is a set decorator. So he had a 12 year job on Two and a Half Men. So if you really want to hear some crazy stories, you should have him talk to you about Charlie. <laughs> Uh, Charlie Sheen. Uh, now he's working on a new Netflix series called The Ranch, which Ashton Kutcher actually just happens to be in, and it looks awesome. But um, yeah, you know, when it was 01, and he's like, so Lynn, the backdrop for the CNN coverage of the riots in Cincinnati is your theater, and it's really embarrassing, like at work, for me to say that that's why you left, so that you could be there instead of marrying me. Um, that was tough. Um, there were many people on our board that left. Uh, half of our board left. Uh, half of them left when they found out about the debt. Another chunk of them left in 01 because they didn't feel there was any way to save this neighborhood. Um, family and friends were like, what the hell? It took you forever to leave. What are you doing back? And, um, and, uh, and interestingly enough, uh, the one person who didn't think I was crazy, um, although she was a little worried about me coming, was my mom who in 1969 was an executive secretary at Liberty and Lynn Street when the buildings were burning around her and uh, there were true race riots at that time. And uh, in her little suits with matching shoes and matching purse, you know, uh, she took the bus every day because she had to support two kids. And she didn't have the option. And she walked through the chaos and the mess and nobody messed with her because if they started to, she'd said, I need to get to my job. And everybody would back off. So she was kind of this like stalwart thing to say, look, you're, she, my, you're, my grandparents were born five blocks from here. She was born about six blocks from here. Uh, it took them a long time to move out to Bridgetown and have a house out there. And she finds it completely unbelievable that I've now spent my career coming back to the neighborhood that they all worked so hard to get out of. Um, but she, was a, she had a real sense of pride about healing as opposed to giving up hope. And um, so yeah, there were a few. And uh, when people say, could you have envisioned this? 
I say, yeah, absolutely. Did I know it was going to be Waffles and Bakersfield and Senate? Did I know that? No. Did I know Washington Park would not become Needle Park, but eventually become this mecca for yuppies on the weekend to come down? <laughs> no. I didn't know that, but I did know this. There was only way, and that was up. It was either quit and fail or move forward. And that's the choice you get to do every day. You can settle, you can quit, you can move forward. So I'm hoping today you'll walk away with here feeling that change is actually is terrifying because it's 99% of the time positive. And if we don't change, we die. Seriously, if we don't change, if we don't take our next breath, we die. So, so that's something that, you know, and, and I, I don't really, your faith system doesn't matter, but no matter what your faith system is, we're in Easter weekend. And Easter weekend, for whatever you believe, the underlying message of that is resurrection. So um, maybe today we can all go forward with a deep breath and go, yeah, you know what? Tomorrow's going to be better than yesterday. And I'm going to learn from whatever mistakes you make tonight. Hopefully you'll know better tomorrow about that. And hopefully tomorrow um, you'll find a fabulous new adventure. I live my life gratefully, even when it was getting up early today. And I was crabby. <laughs> and I was cranky. I was really cranky. I am grateful because that's a day nobody gets promised to them. And that isn't something I've learned with age. That's something I started to be grateful for when, you know, I lost my grandpa when I was nine years old and he was my world. I started to learn then, you don't get a promise for the next day. So seize it. You know, take tomorrow, take today, take the rest of this day and celebrate the fact that you get to do it in a country where you're allowed to do just about anything you want to do. And it'd be really cool if you came back and saw me here because I'm basically here all the time. <laughs> and you know what, that's all right. It's all right, because dealing with the waffle guy next door is a lot better than the crack dealer. So um, as you leave, please uh, these, uh, take these brochures and these programs with you, because it is read more about it, as they say. And uh, I'm really grateful to have had this time to share with you. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks so much. Thank you.